What's your philosophy? Why is it right to encourage leaking of secret information? Yeah, well, there's a question as to what sort of information is important in the world. What sort of information can achieve uh, reform? And there's a lot of information. So information that organizations are spending economic effort into concealing, uh, that's a really good signal uh, that when the information gets out, there's a hope of it doing some good. Circle life. Delicious. This is definitely humane. I, I can sleep well. I want them tested. Keep be fresh in the consumer's mind. So I was looking through the Truth Tobacco Industry documents the other day. It's a vast library of internal industry documents which illustrate just how much the tobacco industry knew about the health effects of smoking and when they knew it. And it also contains documents which shed light on their marketing and advertising strategies on numerous other interesting aspects of their business. I was essentially wishing we, the modern vegan movement, had a comparable library of documents obtained from the animal agricultural industries. I'm sure that one day we will. But I realized that in the meantime, we already have access to some leaked documents which pertain to the industry's dealings. I mean, we know about the corruption that these industries have caused in governments throughout the world. So I thought, why not look at some government documents, some US government documents, because many of these have already been leaked and are publicly available via WikiLeaks. I'm talking specifically about their public library of US diplomacy. So I did a quick search in the library for the word livestock and I was first a little disappointed to see only a handful of decades old results before quickly realizing that this was just the first page of over 7,000 such documents. So I dove right in and it only took me to the third leak in the list before I found evidence of serious deception. And so I'm going to talk about what I found today but I also want to make the point that this is just one document of thousands found with a single keyword relating to animal agriculture. So I'm calling on any vegans who have a blog or a YouTube channel or what have you or who want to start one uh, to collectively data mine these leaks. You know, if you're ever stuck for an idea for a blog or a video or even if you're not, just read through a few of these and see what you uncover. So the diplomatic cable in question came from Robert Blake, who in 1973, when this communique was written, was serving as the US ambassador to Mali. He was writing to his superiors in the US government's Bureau of African Affairs, as well as to the US embassies in the Ivory Coast and Senegal. Now, the cable is about a US aid research report on how meat production in Mali could be increased. And before I get into the leak, I'm going to provide a little background about US aid and its connections to the animal agriculture industries, because if anyone does want to take up the challenge and investigate any more of these leaks in the future, they're probably going to come across these guys quite often. Now, quick disclaimer, I'm not suggesting that this organization doesn't do some good, but I am suggesting that it's not as innocuous as it may seem. So USAID, the United States Agency for International Development, works to advance the political and economic interests of the US, especially US agribusiness. And so it has strong ties with the animal agriculture industry. Long-time viewers will be familiar with a series I did on the Kenya study. Well, the Kenya study was funded in part by the Global Livestock Collaborative Research Support Program, which was in turn funded by USAID through their Office of Agriculture and Food Security. USAID? The guys whose goal it is to help developing nations? The very same. USAID, you see, is not the good Samaritan it first seems. For example, take the amount of food aid that USAID sends abroad which is not dependent on demand, not on the needs of the international community because of drought or what have you, but rather on the surplus that the US agribusiness contractors have that season. Secondly, this food aid is not aid at all in the traditional sense. It's not given freely, but sold to local markets through third party non-governmental organizations, a practice which has been broadly criticized, understandably, even rather admirably by the NGOs themselves. I say it's admirable because USAID also has a reputation for punishing affiliated detractors. But the existence of such detractors demonstrates a fact that I want to stress throughout, and that's that most people working with or for USAID are likely doing so with the best of intentions. However, make no mistake, USAID is structured to aid US agribusiness rather than, and sometimes at the expense of, developing nations. Indeed, they state publicly that some of their core goals are to open new markets for American goods, promote trade overseas, and create jobs here at home. So maybe they don't sacrifice anything to help others, okay? They're just filling their contractors' pockets, but they can still help incidentally, right? And yes, they can and sometimes do. But this is also a clear conflict of interest, something which is exemplified by the fact that they've been criticized for seemingly intentionally contributing to food shortages. 
Take the case of Haiti, for example, where USAID was timing food aid shipments to coincide with local harvests, undercutting local producers and hence destabilizing the Haitian agricultural economy. There's also something of a revolving door culture at USAID. As we've seen, the organization makes no secret of the fact that its goal is to support US agribusiness. It's literally part of their mandate. But the relationship gets much deeper than that. There's a massive movement of personnel from USAID to its agribusiness contractors and vice versa, creating an insider culture where ex-industry personnel shape USAID's policies and actions. Due to these conflicts of interest, reforms have long been proposed and long been blocked because lobbyists have been hired by USAID's agribusiness contractors to resist such reforms. In short, the fact that USAID serves US agribusiness interests is no accident. It's a system which is actively maintained by those within the organization, as well as the wider agricultural industry which benefits from the status quo. But they have aid in their name, which is just an acronym. We've got to move past this. So besides undermining the agricultural industries of foreign nations whilst filling their contractors' pockets, USAID has also been accused of leveraging food aid to create political currency for the US. Some of the ways it's been observed doing this are by increasing food donations to nations that rotate onto the UN Security Council in order to buy influence. They've even helped fund political subversion campaigns in order to destabilize legitimate democratically elected governments and have been accused of aiding in the training of police forces to suppress local leftist groups. Creighton summarizes that USAID has a history of working with the CIA as a front operation to help them spread that special kind of democracy, read as IMF-inspired brutal repression, in nations where we have installed brutal dictators in support of our neoliberal economic agenda. Indeed, there exists a rich historical context for the active manipulation and destabilization of foreign nations by USAID for the benefit of the US government and the US industry. So let's move on to examine the diplomatic cable in question, in which Robert Blake, the US ambassador to Mali, discusses a USAID report. As I mentioned previously, this report provided suggestions for how to increase meat production in Mali. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, what does USAID, or rather what do its US agribusiness contractors, stand to gain from pushing to increase meat production in Mali? Put simply, meat production is inefficient. Increased production requires increased inputs and increased demand for those inputs. And this increased demand essentially translates into an expanded market for US agribusiness exports, you know, the exports of USAID's contractors. However, it's important to note that USA didn't instigate this program out of nowhere. They were invited by the government of Mali to offer their advice on how they could increase livestock production. You see, the government of Mali had their own reasons for wanting to expand the livestock industry. As the USAID report notes, taxes on cattle of all sorts contribute about 6.9% of government revenues, and the livestock industry was responsible for about a quarter of the country's GDP at that time. So you may be wondering, how come you found evidence of deception? I mean, why the need for deception at all? If the government of Mali wanted to increase meat production, and USAID's agribusiness contractors wanted them to increase meat production, then surely they'd have perceived that their interests aligned. Well, whilst they may have perceived as much, this was not necessarily the case. It's clear that fulfilling the government of Mali's request for USAID to design a livestock program to increase meat production was not Blake's main aim, but just a means of accomplishing other ambitions. As he wrote in the beginning of the cable, here with my comments on Mali livestock program, which I've read with great interest, I consider it good vehicle for early launching long delayed plan. Now, we know not the details of this plan. However, it would appear that his goals were not in complete alignment with those of the government of Mali. However, nor indeed were they in complete alignment with those of USAID, or at least not with those of the authors of the USAID report in question. Demonstrating once again the fact that most of the people who work in USAID probably have the best of intentions, the first 35 pages of the report, containing the bulk of the background data on the situation in Mali and the likely impacts of and best approaches to the program, contained numerous references to the potential problems of increasing meat production, which led Blake to make a startling suggestion. This is what first caught my eye about the leaked cable, as he actually recommended that parts of the report be censored writing, I strongly urge that most of the first three sections, pages 1 to 35, be eliminated from any paper given to the Malians, and thus not be translated. 
So to give you an example of the kind of content that he wanted to cut, the report warned that efforts to increase meat production would likely result in significant changes to the traditional way of life for Malian herders. A fact lamented by Blake who stated, even though initial cattle programs small and experimental, it involves major changes in pattern of farmers and herdsmen's lives. And this will be seen by government of Mali as involving political risks and political decisions. Something he recognized as being a barrier to approval at the highest Malian political level. Furthermore, the leak shows that Blake was eager to push the livestock program forward, despite knowing that it would, quote, run against established Malian interests by harming the current cotton production efforts in the region. Now, the report also clearly warned that due to the increases in livestock production that had already taken place in Mali by 1973, that the country's rangelands were at their maximum carrying capacity, or that this carrying capacity may have even been exceeded already, and that it was likely to decline in the future due to several factors, including overgrazing. Hardly a time to start a program designed to increase the numbers of livestock, is it? So whilst the government of Mali may have perceived that their interests aligned with those of the people that Blake represented, it's clear that Blake intended to advance the interests of those he represented, instigating their long-delayed plan at the expense of the Malian people, under the guise of providing them with assistance. Now, I say the interests of the people that Blake represented because it's not completely clear whose interests those were. Now, it may be that this simply meant the interests of the US agribusiness sector, as I mentioned, and that the reason the USAID report wasn't perfectly in tune with these interests in the first place was simply because the report's authors were not corrupt, but merely working within a corrupt system. However, there are two other possibilities that I've explored. So, when asking who would benefit from efforts to increase meat production in Mali, the Ivory Coast is pretty near the top of the list. So the Ivory Coast is Mali's richer neighbour to the south, and in the 1970s its demand for meat far outstripped its production capacity, meaning it had to import. And indeed, as of 1975, 88% of Mali's cattle exports went to the Ivory Coast. But this supply was outstripped by the demand there, resulting in meat shortages in the Ivory Coast. Now, it's worth noting at this juncture that the authors of the USAID study stated that while their recommendations should contribute to addressing the short-term meat supply crisis in Mali's capital city of Bamako, they acknowledged that ultimately market factors will determine the apportionment between export and local consumption. In other words, they can increase meat production, but this extra meat may end up going to the Ivory Coast rather than local Malians. So, the Ivory Coast would certainly have benefited from efforts to increase meat production in Mali, and would be less concerned about whether those benefits came at the expense of the traditional way of life of Mali's citizens. But then the question becomes, why would the US ambassador to Mali be working to advance the interests of the Ivory Coast at the expense of Mali? The answer is that it could be part of a broader US foreign policy strategy, perhaps part of a commitment made by the ambassador to the Ivory Coast to its government in exchange for unknown favours. After all, the Ivory Coast is much richer than Mali, and the US Embassy there was a recipient of this communique, so it was certainly recognised that the influence of this programme would be felt there. And interestingly, shortly after this series of events, Blake was offered a job at the Embassy in the Ivory Coast. Now, the second related possibility that I explored was that Blake was working on behalf of meat packaging and processing companies, as they too would have benefited from increased meat exports to the Ivory Coast. And interestingly, just a few years earlier, Ward Foods, a trade association for a group of US meat processing and packaging companies, despite facing litigation in the US for its part in a conspiracy to engage in anti-competitive price fixing on beef carcasses, also found time to send a team to Mali to quote, appraise the current status of the cattle and meat industry in Mali and the feasibility of a joint venture between Ward Foods and Mali. This could serve as further explanation of why Blake wanted the first 35 pages of the report cut, since it also contained a large section which outlined the reason that Mali ought to continue focusing on live exports rather than meat exports. To quote the report, a policy question of considerable importance relates to actions to promote export of meat rather than live cattle. Although the Malian government is quite interested in increasing the utilization of its modern slaughterhouse at Bamako and exporting meat abroad, there are a number of reasons why it's probably not desirable to commit themselves too strongly to policies or programs oriented in this direction. And it goes on to list the numerous reasons that this is the case, advice which would have obviously worked against the interests of meat processing and packaging companies. And interestingly, beyond cutting the section, Blake in the diplomatic cable seems to suggest that action ought to be taken in the opposite direction, and that the challenge facing them was one of 
how to change enough of present traditional cattle industry into a kind of modern export-oriented industry which will meet Malian and coastal meat needs. And indeed, by the 1980s, live exports to the Ivory Coast were dwindling in favour of frozen meat exports, which had grown exponentially. But for my money, I'd have to say that Occam had it right when he suggested that the simplest answer is usually correct. And I believe he was working to advance the interests of USAID's US agribusiness partners. But whilst there is room to speculate as to exactly whose interests he was working to advance, what we do know for a fact is that he sought to censor huge sections of the USAID report and hide critical information from the government of Mali in order to ensure that the president would give his blessing to a livestock program that Blake himself privately described as running counter to Mali's best interests. Pretty shady. So in closing, I'd like to note that the case I've been talking about here is essentially a blip on the radar. But if we, the vegan community, work together, we can create a comprehensive picture of how US foreign policy and the US Agency for International Development have historically been corrupted and co-opted and used to directly or incidentally advance the interests of the animal agriculture industries at the expense of foreign governments and their citizens. These documents are out there, you know, they're waiting for us to read them. And maybe we've got better things to do, but judging by the content that a lot of vegan YouTubers are making, I'd say most haven't. So help me share this video with the hashtag vegan drama and let's encourage vegan content creators on YouTube to raise the bar. I also want to give a massive shout out to my patrons who support me even when I spend weeks at a time buried in research without uploading. You're amazing, you keep me going, thank you and see you next video.